My name is Lee Wilkins. I'm a faculty member at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. I teach ethics, media ethics, among other things, and this is a uh, great pleasure to be here. It's my second attendance at this conference, and I've always found it really compelling. Our topic for the remainder of the morning is ethics for the investigative newsroom. We have three speakers, two respondents, and then there will be a chance for a discussion among audience members, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Our speakers are in this order. Andy Hall, founder and executive director of Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. He formerly served on the board of investigative reporters and editors and had a 26-year career as an award-winning reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal and the Arizona Republic. Next is Brant Houston, a former colleague of mine at the University of Missouri, where he directed the Center for Investigative Reporters and Editors for more than 10 years. Brant is currently a faculty member and the, excuse me, I'm going to get this right, the Knight Chair of Investigative and Enterprise Reporting at the University of Illinois. He's a print journalist for 17 years and has authored a number of books. Stephen Ward is our third presenter. He needs no introduction except to say, when things go wrong, blame Canada. <laughs> Our two respondents are Carol Toussaint. Carol, I have a confession to make. I would have come all the way here from Columbia, Missouri, just to hear what you have to say. Because Carol doesn't work with journalists. She works with nonprofits. And I think one of the things that we journalists need to understand is that non we have a lot to learn from folks who do nonprofit work, which we are just now getting introduced to. And finally, Martin Kaiser, editor of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, which I think has won, let me see here, that would be a couple of Pulitzers in the last three years. He's not the least bit proud of that, um, but he's also going to be doing some commenting on what the panel say. Format's going to go like this. Each of our speakers has from five to seven minutes, at which point I have this giant invisible hook that I will make them stop talking. Our, uh, moder our, excuse me, our commentators have an equal five to seven minute time. After that, I have another giant hook and I'll yank them off the stage and then we'll turn it over to you. So first, Andy. Okay. That's okay. Oh, you're reorganizing. <laughs> this is not Andy. I'm not Andy. I wish I was because he got more money than me, but that's all right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. You know who I am. Let's just get into this. I am just, uh, you should have in your program uh, the re report that we co-published, uh, and so we're not going to go into all the details of that. Uh, the recommendations, a summary of all our recommendations are in, at the back. So we're just going to touch, uh, I'm going to give the big 36,000 feet overview, and I'll let Andy and Brent pick up particular topics in there and give a bit more details. But we're more interested, in a way, uh, to, to the comments of our respondents and what you have to say. Uh, the origin of the report quickly, it began with a discussion with me and Andy worrying about the emerging ethicus, ethical issues in this uh, nonprofit area, and then Brandt uh, also showed a strong interest, and the three of us decided to have a round table, which was held January 29th here at UW. Uh, and the report virtually uh, does, in fact, summarize uh, the discussion, uh, and it was released April 26th. And you can find it also online on my site, but also uh, sites by Andy and, and Brandt and so on and so forth. So it's, it's out there. Uh, we had seven participants from USA and one from Canada. Rob Cribb, we always have one from Canada, yes. Uh, <laughs> Rob Cribb, investigative reporter from the Toronto Star. Uh, and we wanted to bring some leaders in this area together and have a really intense roundtable discussion to try to identify the issues. And there's their lovely uh, mugshots all up there. And, and I won't go through all their names, but Krista is here, and she can solve all the legal issues you have uh, here today. <laughs> Also, the aim of the report was not to lay down, this is not the definitive, you know, Bible of, non, of the, the ethics in this area. We see it as just the start of a dialogue. Uh, we think this area is evolving and so complex, anybody who thinks they've got a Bible on this is probably fooling themselves. Uh, but we did want the meeting to be practical, and that's why we focused on best practices and tried to come up with some, some recommendations in this area. And then we said, why don't we bring it to the conference and learn how we can do better and what's wrong with this report and so on. So we are sincerely open to ideas of how to improve uh, the ideas in this area. And by far, we do not think this is a perfect uh, report at all. We're just trying to stimulate some conversation. The content of the report... Deal, deciding on who you'll take money from, then 
how you deal with the donors that you will take money from. Conflicts of interest were big, legal considerations as always, new networks of centers, which Brent uh, held that, uh, uh, guided that session, and we also had Rob Cribb on the Canadian landscape. By the way, if you really think raising money in the United States is hard, why don't you go north to Canada, right? Uh, what I've, I can't believe here is uh, the philanthropic spirit and the nu uh, numerous amounts of uh, philanthropic societies that can possibly help you. In Canada, nonprofit is struggling because we, we don't have, uh, one reason is we don't have uh, those resources. Anyway, uh, the seven major questions. Who is an acceptable donor? How avoid misunderstandings with funders? How, be tra how transparent, as, as Chuck said? How protect editorial independence, as Chuck said, right? Chuck set us up beautifully, I think. Uh, if you are going to use your investigative center to advocate for reform and change, uh, what about objectivity? Hello? Uh, ethical implications of national and international networks. Once you get people working together, how do you get them all working together according to certain standards? And what sort of ethics is going to develop in this area? The best summary, best practices, again, uh, I'm looking at my time here. Uh, very quickly, transparency, which uh, Andy will talk about a lot, uh, it aims at the high, uh, the, the agreement was that of course we need to aim at the highest degree of transparency and disclose our policies, our mission statements, newsroom contacts, and so on and so forth. And we should explain key editorial and fundraising decisions and uh, uh, solicit public comment. So in general, those were very high sort of abstract principles that people agreed on. Deciding on donors, the whole idea of having to vet your donors very carefully, especially since many of these donors will have multiple missions, multiple parts of their enterprises, and so you need to be aware of all of that. Consider how the link with this group is going to affect your own integrity, and here comes the golden god, I guess, back at you. You really have to figure out whether there's going to be some downside to association. And develop criteria for acceptable donors. And Andy talked about, I loved it, we start from a creepy list of felons, murderers, axe murderers, right? Uh, and then maybe, and then hopefully we, you know, we, 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 mobsters, right? We won't take money from mobsters. And that's, that's the easy part. Then you get to government, corporations, and unions, and then onwards from there. And it gets more and more difficult as you go on. Uh, but uh, the, the advice was we've got to develop, you should develop criteria in this area. Dealing with donors, yes, of course. Uh, reveal identities of all donors except in rare cases. In those cases, explain. I'm sure there'll be some discussion on that. Uh, accept conditions on contributions only if it aligns with your mission and make them public. Retain editorial control. Again, uh, a message stressed by Chuck and develop clear policies in this area. If you're working with foundations, they may use a different language than you. They talk often about deliverables, right? Outcomes. What do they mean by that, right? And the, the, the roundtable felt we really have to get into that language with them and find out what their expectations are. Many community groups you will meet with and, and try to raise money from were, are not journalists, and you have to explain your journalism to them, and that you will protect that journalism uh, as a first priority. Uh, more in sort of my area, the role of ethics, I was interested, but the take home message of the entire round table is that you've got to protect the integrity of that journalism, no matter how dependent you are on a limited circle of funders, and that's easier than said. Uh, only independence, transparency about sponsorship, clear rules of, on conflicts, and frank communication will maintain the public confidence in these experiments. Also, in terms of the role of ethics, uh, many of us uh, have said, will have said in the report and say over and over again that some of these issues are not new. Nonprofit journalism has uh, existed for a long time. Conflicts of interest have been problems in journalism for years and years. But uh, there was also a feeling, however, that these problems are emerging in new contexts, in new organizations. And so we do need a new discussion and new policies on this. And attention to ethics is crucial, especially as, as several uh, pointed out strongly, because there's a feeling, there was a feeling at the round table, um, that these centers are going to get increased scrutiny, not only from mainstream journalists, but from the public as this movement mo moves along. And I think we're already seeing that with what Chuck talked about with, with regard to think tanks or conservative or liberal groups starting their own, their own centers and so on. Finally, that's been our editorial team, uh, Wendy Swanberg, uh, co-editor and layout. We had contributing editors from Andy, Brandt, Rob Cribb, Magna Koznia, uh, Kos uh, sorry, Kanizna. Uh, she uh, is a graduate student at our school. She helped to uh, write uh, up um, uh, Chuck's comments. He, he appeared through Skype. Uh, Krista Westerberg uh, handled the legal side. Uh, 
And special thanks to Glenda Thompson Transparency. She's my wife, okay. Um, <laughs> she helped out with uh, final copy editing and formatting, and so there you go. Uh, it all worked out. Our funders in transparency, we're talking about transparency, the, our, my center, thanks to the Ethics and Excellence Journalism Foundation, uh, Andy's Wisconsin uh, Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, uh, Brant's Night Chair in Investigative and Enterprise Reporting, and of course the, uh, the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. So we'll stop there. And Andy will take over. <laughs> Was that five or roughly five? Or? Sorry, okay. Thanks, so good morning, and I, I promise to keep this brief, so Lee, you won't need to get the big hook out for me. So, um, S Stephen mentioned that, uh, you know, he was taking the aerial view, so I guess, um, you know, I come at this from the, the ground level view uh, with operating a startup nonprofit news organization. Yeah, I uh, was in Stephen's office just uh, and wrestling with some actual difficulties. Um, I was feeling a bit paralyzed, actually. <laughs> Could I go to uh, foundations and ask them for money if, if members of the Board of Trustees uh, were also newsmakers? You know, if you have union officials, uh, top school officials, top business officials sitting on that Board of Trustees, can you go and say, hey, how about giving us some money? Um, we obviously are going to at some point need to attract money from other sources other than our current sources of, sources of funding. We, we, most of our money, we raised about 350000 so far, and almost all of it is from out-of-state big foundations. So as, as we and other state and locally focused centers uh, grow and mature, we're going to have to uh, acquire more, more local funding. And so that means uh, either we figure out ways to do that and uphold high standards of ethics and integrity, um, or, as Chuck uh, Lewis mentioned earlier, uh, we can be, become so pure that we end up uh, closing because of uh, lack of funds. So, you know, I had these other questions. Can we accept anonymous donations? Uh, and if we do accept strings, what types of strings? At what point do we cross a line and end up, uh, again, uh, cutting into the integrity of our work? So, uh, throughout the day-long discussion, um, as you've heard already, uh, there was widespread agreement that we need to find ways to be as open as we can about how we're raising the money and, our, and, and how we go about doing the journalism. And we need to have that, that wall between uh, the creation of the journalism uh, and, and the, the asking uh, for money. We need to be as open as we can about the other aspects of our operations, the finances, posting our 990s, uh, other, other information, reveal donors except in rare cases, and when you do that, explain why. Um, the strings can only be there if they don't divert us from our overall mission as a journalism organization. Uh, don't let funders have undue influence over where we're heading. Uh, retaining editorial control and publishing explanations, you know, uh, and you see mainstream media doing this more and more as well, uh, an inside the newsroom type story that explains how we got to this decision. And of course, you, you saw that kind of, that kind of, um, of uh, editor's note appearing even decades ago, but they're becoming much more common. In collaboration, and, and I think Brand will talk some more about this later, um, a whole new range of issues, uh, our own standards plus those of the partners we were choosing to collaborate with, how might our association uh, with other news organizations that have different standards affect the credibility? Um, and then uh, as Chuck Lewis has always stressed since he created the Center for Public Integrity in 1989, okay, you start with a plan, but you've got to adapt. Adaptability is, is a key to survival. So how do you do that um, and, and still, um, again, stay true to the mission of the organization and true to the vision? I would say, you know, at the ground level, uh, what we're attempting to do uh, at the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism uh, and on our website, uh, wisconsinwatch.org, is uh, we're trying to put some of these new recommendations into practice. Uh, already we, we uh, prominently list on our website the identities of, of all of our donors, um, and as a result of uh, a board vote that was taken yesterday, uh, we'll also uh, soon be posting our new fundraising policy, and that will disclose the standards. Uh, and basically, uh, it, it, it's always important for a, a board of directors uh, to retain full control over all the fundraising operations and, and make those, those uh, decisions uh, 
on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to uh, watch out for the best long-term business interests of the organization. Uh, but uh, the Wisconsin Center uh, Board has decided not to accept money, for example, from uh, political officials, uh, from political parties, and um, others whose, whose uh, reputations um, may tend to jeopardize uh, the, the interests of the center. Uh, and that, that could be interpreted as um, affecting the public perception of the integrity of the, of the center's work. Uh, we also, um, the board yesterday also unanimously voted uh, that uh, the policy will call for identification of all the donors. Uh, we will not accept uh, anonymous contributions. So that's, that's a, a glimpse into how we're, we're starting to uh, wrestle with these issues um, here on the ground. And um, I, I don't see a hook coming out yet, but I, I've said what I need to say. <laughs> Thanks. Let's see if I can be technologically unimpaired here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, a little background. Um, I ran investigative reports and editors, an organization of 4,000 uh, journalists for uh, more than 10 years. And life was much simpler then. Um, IRE, as it was known, was incapable of having an ethics code. So my life was easy. You can't get 4,000 investigative journalists to agree on anything, much less an ethics code. Um, in addition, the reason they didn't agree is because they feel that one size fits all. So my life was much simpler. Um, now I, I'm doing this, and I'm working with networks, and uh, I'm having to really try to think through what kind of guidelines uh, should be out there. I'm just throwing three networks up there uh, one is Investigative News Network, and I'm coordinating the early efforts of that to hire a CEO. And then there's the Media Consortium, which um, is transparent about having uh, progressive leanings uh, among all the people in its network. And then there's the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity, uh, which it seems to be financed by one source, but promises, and it's according to, they can do this according to law, promises anonymity to all its donors. And uh, they're setting up a lot of state house bureaus and, uh, and no one knows exactly where the money's coming from. So networks bring to us a lot of uh, different challenges. But what I have found over the uh, dis discussions here and talking with people that it really seems the networks need to have as much transparency on funding and on spending as possible. That's, would say, a rule number one. And why? It all comes down to credibility, 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 sort of real estate, location, location, location. It's credibility. Uh, you want people to believe you, and they need to know where you're coming from, and they need to make their own judgments about it. So starting points, uh, and this comes from discussions I've had not only in the United States, but in other countries. And one of the things that comes up, if you can't be transparent about your donors, say why. If you are going to take anonymous donations, you really need to dig in and say why that's going to be. And you'll see people believe that and think it's necessary. This is, to me, the same situation as anonymous sources. We have the same debates on anonymous sources. Be transparent about how you spend donations and whether the spending is directed or limited by the donor. It's pretty simple stuff. Just tell people, Here, this is how we're spending the money we got in. The donor directed it in this particular way. They wanted environment covered or we wanted to cover environment. And they, uh, they said that's a great match and we'll help you. Any kind of topic. And then the most important thing I've found is to try to find that tolerance level among network members on government funding and potential conflicts of interest between funding and stories. If you leave the United States and you start to have discussions, you'll find in Europe in particular, uh, there's a long history of journalism organizations taking government money and turning around and criticizing the government. It seems like everyone accepts the fact that you're going to bite the hand that feeds you. This makes everyone from the U.S. and journalists, for the most part, incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, but if you're going to work with people on conferences and so forth, you're going to have to deal with the fact that there are different standards. And so rather than try to shovel one person's standard on another, we sort of let it be that if you're going to do uh, 
uh, a conference, say, and somebody from Denmark is raising the money, then if they take Danish money, uh, we don't want to have a national, uh, international uh, conflict over that. Um, we accept it on the fact that it is transparent where it's coming from, and then I think as journalists take great pleasure that they go on to criticize the government and invite government officials to come and be criticized at the conference. So you don't feel like things are being steered very much by that. But nonetheless, I think we need to foster collaborations of, of these networks of journalism organizations, these nonprofits, to start not with, oh, we need an ethics code, but to really just talk about what is, how can we have the highest standard for the reporting? And how do we determine that? And how do we get these standards that will give us the greatest credibility? So I think the only way it's worked in international discussions is to start backwards to say, we want to have a credible story. How do we do that if we're getting funding? How do we prove to people that we did the most credible, balanced story we possibly could? There are no easy answers to this. I know that Chuck Lewis has had many discussions about this. And, um, and I just wanted to show you one thing. In terms, we've talked about nonprofits here. I think we have nearly 30 nonprofit organizations as part of the uh, Investigative News Network in the US, which expects to go international. But back in 2003, another network began, which is the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And you can see uh, where various nonprofit organizations have been forming, um, especially since 2003, around the world by this map. And there was recently a conference in Geneva, Switzerland, despite volcanic ash, where more than 500 journalists showed up from 90 countries. And I think I'm going right about the end of time. One of the more interesting discussions was uh, sitting with a steering committee of this group and just talking about funding for the next conference. And I'll leave that for later or questions. But if you think you can have a tough discussion about uh, the ethics of uh, fundraising and doing stories in the US, try getting everybody from here involved. And uh, you're going to have a very robust debate. So thanks very much. Okay. We decided we'd sit down. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been reading this report, uh, bits and pieces of it, over the last couple of weeks. So I had time to write a few observations. But uh, Chuck Lewis gave me a whole new list of things to comment on. I'll go quickly. While all of you have been concerning yourselves with what amount of money you will accept from whom, whether it will or will not have strings attached, guess what? Your donors have been looking at you pretty critically. And all I can think of to say is, as I listen, I know why you make some of the comments. It's because you're new at it. Funders have been doing this for years. They have a lot more experience to bring to the table. And they also have um, their own best practices. And among their best practices, in the US at least, is what the IRS says they can and cannot do. So they're not floundering all of the time looking for best practices. And they may never ask you if you have a list. But what they do care about and will ask you about is how you keep your eligibility as a nonprofit organization. Uh, the disconnect, and I, that's not my term, but I wish I had thought of it, between the foundation world and media was identified uh, by a journalist when she took over the so-called trade association, the 2,000 plus member organization called the Council on Foundations. And coming from a background in journalism, a woman named Dot Ridings uh, said, you know, I know about the foundation world. I've been a practicing journalist. And I've got to get these two groups together somehow or other. Um, she said she thought that probably to the media charity 
is a good story for one day. On the other hand, foundations had been staying undercover as much as they could, lest someone decided to investigate. And uh, so she tried to uh, manage that through a whole series of things. And she has, uh, she left the foundation, Council on Foundation after 10 years. And I'm gonna tell you something that happened at their annual meeting earlier this week and see if it resonates with you. Uh, the theme of their annual meeting was intersections, public, private, and philanthropic roles in creating change. Now I heard Chuck Lewis use change agent phrase this morning. Uh, people first start, I first heard people talking about being a change agent uh, 30 years ago when I got into the foundation field. Foundations believe they are change agents and they've got a lot of evidence of it. So you're sort of in uh, the same boat there, but I don't know if you knew you were in the same boat. <laughs> Uh, the keynote speaker for the Council on Foundations was Valerie Jarrett, the senior advisor to President Obama. And the entire conference agenda was uh, topics that you as journalists would be very interested in. And the final session was billed as a town hall conversation where to go in the next chapter of a public philanthropic partnership. And it was organized by the current CEO of the Council on Foundations, a guy a lot of you people in this room know because it's Steve Gunderson, who for years was a congressman from Wisconsin. So I guess if I'm giving advice, my advice is Take the time to really get to know a lot about foundations. And the Council on Foundations, or hey, asking Steve Gunderson to stop by sometime and talk with you might not be a bad place to start. The transparency issue, I think there's total agreement on. Um, I really do. But the comment about not putting your 990 on your website. Hello, has anybody heard of GuideStar? Mm -hmm. Absolutely every nonprofit out there, except for some that are under the minimum levels of fundraising, you'll find them. And they, those foundations, those donors, will find you in GuideStar and learn a whole lot about you. So I think transparency is working all the way around. So what should you worry about? Well, you've touched on a number of them. Taking too much from one donor, and I just heard Andy say, you're going to say who every donor is, and I commend you for that. Uh, you talked, uh, Chuck talked about how they might give you money at the start, but they're fickle. Well, come on. Foundations are not in business to see that you stay in business, and a lot of them like to help you start up and then say, okay, get your own legs and start running. And that is not uncommon, and in my judgment, that is not fickle. Now, I am really, really glad that several of you have used the word pure. I do not know how many of us in the room today would identify ourselves as pure in terms of our motives or our actions, but the first time it came up in, in the paper, I thought, Oh, this is too good to let it go by. <laughs> so it was, and, and then Chuck Lewis did it again. Andy, I think you did too. Do you? Yeah, you did, Andy. Thanks, guys. <laughs> but Robert Cripp said this: operators of nonprofit newsrooms struggle with funding issues because even if they accept money, 
from the purest sources, individuals and foundations, they still may slip into ethical quagmires. Identifying, as he did, individuals and foundations as somehow more pure than other types of foundations, excuse me, raised a question in my mind. And it may set up a distinction that's a little hard to live with as you go forward. So the question is really, are you going to investigate where and how the individual got the funds to begin with? Is that part of what you're looking for in terms of pure? Maybe it's just someone who really cares about what you're doing. And if that's the case, do you care if it was stock from this company or that company? How are you going to go about looking at it? Well, the real reason, I'm so glad you used pure because it's one of my favorite May West quotes. I don't quote May a lot, but this one is too good to pass up. It is said that at one time, May West made the comment, I once was pure as the driven snow, but I've drifted. <laughs> Boy, I don't know if I want to follow that. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk for a little bit about coming at it from a uh, traditional media uh, newsroom. And as Chuck was kind enough to point out, we are far from pure <laughs> in our history in, uh, in newsrooms. And I think the, the whole issue behind this is incredibly important around um, credibility. And I find that the credibility of the news that we're putting out and where it's coming from has never been more important, at least in the 30, 40 years that I've been in, in this business. Um, I started as a, as a child, a six-year-old working in this room. No. And um, it, it's really important because I, it, it's changed. You know, when I got into it, um, it was a one-way street. Um, the, Newspapers had their big printing presses, TV and radio had their TV towers, and boy, they could tell you anything that, that they wanted. And as the media world is fractured and it's coming from so many places, uh, your credibility is, is so important, and it ties into, I think, what this, the country's struggling with is this whole issue of news literacy and where, where are we getting our news from? And as you see it um, fractured, you look at the agendas that come from all the different uh, news, news media outlets. Uh, I was speaking to a group yesterday morning in, in Milwaukee, and uh, one of the people in the, in the group raised the question of, so how do you find your place when you got Fox over here and MSNBC over here and Wall Street Journal, and can, can you survive doing um, pure evidence-based uh, journalism? that I wrote about in our newspaper last Sunday where I just think that we have to find our place and, and we spend a lot of time in Milwaukee on investigative and enterprise reporting and think that that's our, our foundation and our brand and we just have to keep doing that and go beyond what happened yesterday but really give the why. To do that though, the, the credibility just becomes huge and what are the, the ethics policies behind that and what are the thoughts that you have about that? And, one of the things that struck me when all of a sudden I got handed the editor's chair at the, at the newspaper, it, it was easier before if you're an assistant managing editor or you're a managing editor and you're overseeing projects and full speed ahead working with your reporter and all of a sudden now it comes to the editor and there you've read it over and maybe you haven't been as involved along the way and you're that last line of defense to holding on to sometimes the credibility of the paper and I've had times with six or seven editors and reporters in my office thinking boy we got them on this one and I have to go back to thinking of um, what I think the best reporters do and which is where's the curiosity what am I missing um, how can I find out more um, what's in this story what's behind it you know what are we, what are we missing 
which I would transfer back to the big problem with all the, the commentators, whether it's on blogs or television or, or radio and even some newspaper columnists. They think they got it all figured out. And, and you know, they don't want to ask the questions that good reporters do of how can I find out more and where can I dig into it. And what, it, what I think it comes back to what you've done a great job of, of putting together is sort of putting this discussion of ethics out there. And I, I give you an example of a story we wrote. One of our best reporters was really good investigative reporters working on, and he, he wanders into my office and he says, this is going to end up on your desk eventually, so I'm coming straight to you on this. And he gives me the information and I explain what I think it will take to get it into the paper. And eventually, um, you know, I could be right or wrong, but eventually I got to the point where you need this and this, otherwise it's not going to the paper. And the next day, um, he came to my office and said, maybe, I know you're not going to change your opinion, and we worked together long enough, but one of the TV stations is going to have it on um, TV tonight. And the reporter, um, so I thought, well, let's, let's see how they do it. I said, I'm not changing my opinion. And the, re the television reporter made a phone call to our reporter about 15 minutes before he was going to go on the air. And, and he said, I heard through the grapevine that um, uh, to our reporter, you have this, and I don't know why, why it hasn't been in the paper. And because we talked to our lawyers. Our lawyers say, this is fine, no problem. We can go straight ahead with this. The legal department says it's great. And our reporter says, well, I'm sure Marty would be happy to talk to you, but it doesn't have anything to do with the, um, legally whether it's right or wrong. He just ethically thinks that um, uh, it, we don't, this isn't a story. And the reporter, and we, we could argue all day at some point about whether it was a story. I probably may have been wrong. But what was fascinating to me was the television reporter said, we haven't had an ethics discussion in our newsroom for 10 years. <laughs> I mean, or some incredible amount. It was all about if we can get it improved by then. This happened on another story we did a few years ago where I had even our First Amendment lawyer saying, well, you can go with it. You can go with it. I said, that, that's not the point. Where we got the information, I'm very uncomfortable with, with how we obtained um, that information. So this discussion of ethics and spreading it out um, to nonprofits is tremendously important and where it's also important with what um, Chuck brought up is the partnerships that are taking place across the country because the, it is a crisis. The, the amount of reporters that we have lost from traditional newsrooms um, is, is reporting is suffering and, and as we watch What's interesting to me, and I think this is why there is some hit back at the media and distrust, the, the sort of this, the, the real reporters, we're having fewer of them, while we seem to grow this media of commenting seems to grow where everybody's on television and radio and they've got all the answers, and, and we mix and match these. It's, I, I believe it's sort of at our peril because they get confused and, and what, where's this information um, coming from? So to strengthen our reporting, uh, to be able to partner and work with um, some of these nonprofit groups to do strong investigative reporting, which I just think is so necessary and, and I want to be part of it. It's, it gets personal. If we're not doing that, if we're just going to sit there with a bunch of opinion, I, I'll, I'll go find some pump gas or something like that. <laughs> um, but at, as these ethics policies are developed. I, you know, I looked at the report and then I got out our own ethics policy and um, it made me think about some of the things that we last really went through it, uh, five years ago. But it, it, it just sort of those key things. Uh, when you're working, partnering, you know, who I, I, know, I think I know in our newsroom who are, where the conflicts of interest are. You know, I, I don't pretend to know it all. As some editor once said, you know, probably every day there's uh, uh, two or three reporters out there doing something that would scare the living daylights out of it if you knew what they were doing. But all these things, of the, where are the conflicts of interest? What are the relationships the reporters might have to sources? What, what's their political activity in the past? You know, what kind of confidential sources agreements? And so the more discussion of this goes on, I think that the better we are and the better our reporting is. And finally, it's all about trying to maintain credibility and, as I said to Stephen this morning, sometimes in this wild, wild west world of what's going on. So I thank you all for really the work you've done. It's really impressive. Thank you all very much.
that, well, that was a signal to clap. <laughs> Now we come to the part of the program where you get to talk, and Stephen has asked me to do a couple of things. Um, this is the part where you get to regard me as a combination of Oprah Winfrey, except I have neither her money nor her personal trainer, and woman with electric cattle prod, i.e. the microphone. So I'm going to start with some questions, and I'm going to stick the microphone in your face, and guess what? You get to respond. The students in here, of course, are used to this because they've had a lot of professor abuse in the past four years, but the journalists on the other hand may be a little bit less used to it. So I'm going to start here. When I say the words Nazi collaborator, what comes to mind? Um, German troops. Good thing or bad thing? Uh, bad thing. When I say the words collaborator with investigative reporters, what comes to mind? The public. Say a little bit more? people with an interest in the truth being known. Okay. So both of those groups sound to me like they have an agenda. One of them may be a little bit uh, friendlier, perhaps, than another. Um, I'm also going to have the pleasure of picking on people that I know. David, if you're going to talk to your students about collaboration, what are some of the things you're going to speak to them about? Um, ethical lines of conflict of interest. Um, some of the things I'm hearing here, new issues about who the partners are, a lot more complex range of stakeholders to understand than there used to be. Okay, we used an ethics word stakeholders here. Um, anybody worried a little bit about means and ends and all of this? I mean, I would assume that most of you would be uncomfortable to be called a Nazi collaborator. Why is that? It's got a bad rep. <laughs> What's so bad about it? Well, it has, has to do with, uh, I don't know, bad, bad decisions, oppressing people, murder, stuff like that. If there's a Nazi collaborator living in your community, even in this day and age, is that newsworthy? Yes. Why? Because, I don't know. Sure, you can do Take deep breath and try. Because, um... It's important for our community to know that. Okay. Because it's important for our community to know? Because maybe we think that somehow if you were a Nazi collaborator 40 years ago, you can't have shed that mantle quite so easily? Sheila, if there's a collaborator with investigative reporters and editors living in your neighborhood, is that newsworthy? A member? No, it's not. <laughs> Why not? Well, journalists aren't celebrities. Journalists are getting the facts. And I'd like to understand um, their assumptions and their fealty to truly fact-checking what they think they know. Okay, the they in that sentence refers to? The journalists. So, okay. So, we're uncomfortable with Nazi collaborators. We're really comfortable with journalism collaborators. Anybody in here think that maybe who collaborates with journalists might conceivably be a news story? But she's not a journalist. Journalists in the room, we just learned something. Talk. I think there's a conflict of interest. Over what? Uh, the collaborator may have a mission that they want to get the journalist to be the sucker to put it out there for you. OK. Anybody else thinks that who collaborates with journalists might conceivably be a new other story? Other than me, obviously, I wouldn't have asked that question if I didn't have a view. Why is it or is it not a news story? It's a news story if it uh, influences the outcome of the story. Um, it's uh, a, a news story if it if it reflects on the on the motives of the journalist. Um, it may be a news story even when it's not a news story. In other words, um, there may be reasons why the collaborator should not be identified as part of the news story. Some people might need to know that information. Okay, another interesting concept just came up, need to know. Why might it be important that we need to know who's collaborating with whom, regardless of whether it's people we like or don't like? Because it's a community and you, can, you can't just pull a shade over one part of it. 
Okay, I thank you. You're brilliant. I really appreciate that answer. Um, I want to emphasize that because it's the first time that this comment has been framed in this way, um, except for a little, a little bit. By um, we journalists tend to talk about individuality, autonomy. Um, what it is that we want to do. We're really focused on us. It really is all about me. This is the first time where we go, oh, but wait a minute, the community has an interest here. It may be separate from our interest, although there may be places where it dovetails. So the notion that we might need to think about this from the community's perspective, okay, keep in mind, I teach ethics. That's pretty important, maybe as important as thinking about it from our own perspective, okay? What else about this report strikes you? There's a danger here. Everybody will now shut up because I haven't primed you with questions. <laughs> How many of you ever have talked to folks in your advertising departments about these questions? Other than to say really awful things about them? I've heard a number of those this morning. I'm going to pick on you. You said you were a recovering fundraiser, and that got a big laugh. Why? Because they, uh, um, uh, there's a perception that perhaps the fundraiser will mislead a prospective donor. I'm going to push a little bit. Is that perception true, do you think? At times, yes. Could you do your job long term if that were true a lot? No, because I would lose my credibility. Gee, somebody other than journalists has credibility in this room. That's kind of fascinating. What about the notion of, as Brent was talking about, government support? I know that makes US journalists incredibly, incredibly is, is government at this point in the U.S. any better or any worse a collaborator than, say, AIG? Well, I think it depends on the type of government support. If it's um, an NPR, CPP grant that's sort of competitive, but if it's a special congressperson's dispensation to you, then that's a little trickier. So in other words, we should be wary of earmarks and pork? Is that what you're saying? Well, if it's pork, you should realize what you're eating. I'll phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. OK, that's on the government side. Anybody worry about venture capitalists in the same way? Sure, they have motives just like everyone else. So uh, if we're worried about collaborating with anyone, we should be worried about collaborating with anyone and understanding the motives that anyone has. Keeping in mind that most of here are US. So why do we worry so much more about the motives that government has as opposed to the motives of venture capitalists? I'm, tr I'm trying to pick on a corporation I like. Um, and having a little bit of a hard time here, but let's say, well, I don't know, you can all get in an argument about, it. but let's say something like, um, you know, Google, which says as its corporate role that it will do no evil. Um, sh should we collaborate with Google? I think we could collaborate with Google. Um, collaborating with the government is um, different because it's, uh, central to the core of the integrity of our independence uh, to produce uh, material that uh, the public trusts. Anybody want to add something onto that other than me? Keep in mind I have the great luck of, of teaching class with a lot of international students. Is, is government the only issue for, aha, somebody volunteered. Okay, I think it really depends on the type of government funding. I spent 16 years working for the BBC and, you know, writing bad things about the government was never an issue. In fact, most governments tend to dislike the BBC because it's far more critical and holds them to account than most of commercial independent newspapers. If we look at things like the Times, Sunday Times, The Sun, the Murdoch group of newspapers, they're a commercial operation. You could argue that Fundamentally, there's much more political bias there than in a government funding organization. 
similarly in Canada, you know, I've worked on projects that are essentially government funded, but it's not so much where the funding comes from, but the arrangements of that funding. How is that organized? What are your responsibilities? The issue of what are your deliverables? To what extent do you have editorial independence? So the issue is much more nuanced and complex than just is it coming from the government or is it coming from Google? It's how is it coming? What are the conditions attached to that money and what are we going to do and aim to produce at the end of it? Do we have questions from the, from the virtual participants? I hate to call them the blockosphere. Thank you so much for not calling them that. Um, okay, so we have two sort of conflicting question comments. And one is, um, the first is, transparency is one of those great buzzwords out there that you hear at almost every conference, but is it really practiced? Is it really ever practiced? And on the other side, is transparency at all helpful when there's been ethically questionable behavior? Does it really solve anything, or is it just a buzzword? Okay, that takes us off in a different direction, and I'm glad to go there, so let's start. When you talk about the word transparency, either in your professional life or the personal life, or your personal life, what are some things you're getting at? Um, yikes. Um, I think it's, um, I think transparency is, is crucial. I mean, it's, uh, when you talk about transparency, it's opening up the process to the extent that you can or what, what agendas might be there. But just to take issue with uh, th this thing about you know, government funding and the nuances of how you get it and so on, um, there's something inherent there. If you're funded by the government, the viewer or the reader, or whatever, should take it with a grain of salt. Where I work happens to be a unit of a very large conglomerate, General Electric. We report on General Electric every so often. Uh, it sometimes is uncomfortable. They're, they are as hands-off as we can expect them to be, but if I were a viewer, an investor, wanting to know what's going on at General Electric, I would not get my information from only CNBC because there's just something there. So, you know, so I think there, there absolutely need to be policies in place internally to prevent donors, funders, owners, whatever, from influencing the process. Uh, but some, some transparency is just out there and there's some things you just can't mitigate. Okay, that was a great comment on a couple of levels. First off, you associate transparency with process. And that's an interesting torque on that word because as we've been using it here, we've been associating transparency with individual gifts and source of funding. So, I mean, that's a different way of thinking about, about transparency because it doesn't adhere quite so much to the individual as it does to the process the organization went through. Um, the other thing that you said that I thought was really cool is you said people shouldn't get their information only from one place. Um, not to bring reality screaming into this room because we wouldn't want that. Um, the fact is, is that we know from many, many, many surveys that increasingly Americans, at least, are, are, are narrowing down their news diet especially, um, particularly folks under 30 who are, in general, getting a lot of their information from folks, from, kind, from programs that people my age would tend to call entertainment. So anyway, um, students who are used to abuse, when I say the word transparency, what do you associate it with? Start here. just. I'm, I like that I'm being called a student. <laughs> I was just thinking of the, the nuances between personal and professional transparency. If I'm personally, say, a gun-toting conservative, but professionally I'm, a, you know, I'm on the board of the Humane Society, does that make a difference? I don't know if that's contributing to the conversation, but I've been thinking about that, who you are as a human and then who you are you know, as a funder. Could you repeat the question? Sure. When I use the word transparency, what does that mean to you, either at a personal or professional level? I guess I think of it as well as part of the process of reporting and sort of checking yourself along the way and reviewing your own personal, I guess, or professional ties to a story along the way while you're reporting. All right. Uh, I think of transparency as, as a process thing. So uh, what you know, but then also how you know it, who told you it, sort of the, the process of, of sharing the process of what you did. Okay, um, this maybe comes to me by virtue of the fact that I use the word Lee, but one of the things I think is interesting, and the reason I carve it up as personal and professional is because 
there were times when I thought it would be transparent to tell people this story is being written by a, um, in my case, 60-year-old Caucasian woman of middle-class background who was born in Denver, Colorado, and has spent much of her life in college towns and definitely takes money from the trough of the taxpayers of the state of Missouri. Um, you all may think that that's excessive, but I'm here to tell you that as a journalist, the fact that I'm female, the fact that I'm middle class, the fact that I'm Caucasian absolutely influences what I think is news and how I write about that news. Um, so it's interesting, that's why I carve it up in that way, and I think it's interesting that in this room we are saying, well, transparency could also be transparency about process as well as just who we are. Um, other questions or comments about, about this report? Yep, I'm coming. I guess, uh, I guess a question about diversity of opinion and, and funding. For example, uh, can't we address a variety of ethical issues for, on the funding end? For example, if you had a private foundation, a government grant, a union, and a business all funding a news operation so that they would offset each other the way uh, a diversity of opinions within the newsroom tends to round out and make honest, if you will, the end product. Andy, I'm going to throw that one back at you. What do you think? Uh, I, I certainly agree with that, Herman. I think that that's uh, precisely uh, what, what, uh, where our conversation went uh, during a roundtable discussion. Uh, the, the greater the diversity of funders uh, and the greater the number of funders, um, the, the, the more um, integrity uh, the coverage can have. Um, but, you know, and that's why I think then the, the transparency is so critical uh, the, uh, that we list those funders so that, you know, just like uh, people know who's uh, buying advertising in newspapers and on broadcast outlets, this is sort of the equivalent of that in the nonprofit world. Uh, it's, it's disclosing basically who our sponsors are. And, and uh, so I, I think that way also uh, it increases our chances of financial survival by bringing in uh, funding from a greater range of sources. Brant, I want to throw you a little bit of a, of a graft on that. Let's say that there is a, a project that's being done in cooperation with a group of folks from the UK and a group of folks from the US, and let's say because it's the UK, there is there's government funding involved. How do you negotiate the transparency on, on that one, or, 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 or are we at the place where you want to even try that? Oh, I think the transparency is key to it. Uh, in fact, there is an interesting project going on in uh, Europe on corruption and uh, I don't have it on the website, but if you were to go there, you would see it was both government and foundation funded, involves reporters from a number of different countries. And so when we've talked over there, it's been basically you've got to say where the funding's coming from to get an idea of where the influence is. Okay, somebody had their hand up and, ah, yes ma'am, from the um, virtual participants. Well, the virtual participants have a little flame to throw. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the way I see it when it comes to transparency and accountability, journalists hold themselves to a lower standard than they hold everyone else. Businesses, government, celebrities. Can the panel argue with me on that point? Well, the moderator can't, so anybody want to anybody wanna take that? Okay, Stephen, let's have a fight. I can't stay quiet for this long. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think you're right. I think historically, uh, if you look at uh, the history of newsroom accountability policies, practices, you'll see bright, okay, you'll see bright lights in which uh, journalism and journalists have taking, taken that seriously. Uh, and you'll see lots who don't. I, as an ethicist, and I've t uh, for the past, what, 12 years, I don't know how many journalists have told me that eth ethics is a waste of time anyway. It's, it's a joke. Uh, it's a cover for, you know, other things. Uh, I know so many newsrooms who wouldn't even consider my idea that maybe they should have some editorial policies up on their websites and take it all seriously. No, nah, you know, it's a practical craft. We just do it one day at a time and, you know, sort of, we just do a, we just sort of work it out. Uh, so I think there's a legitimate, the public is a legitimate reason, and I'm not throwing all journalists in this camp, but the, the public is a legitimate reason and a reasonable reason to worry about transparency and accountability in journalism because we have not done our job properly. I'm not, again, not everyone. And why are we concerned about transparency now? 
well, man, there might be some money attached to it. There might be some markets. There might be some, uh, some people who will stop watching us. Uh, maybe people are looking more carefully at us. Hey, that's a good thing. But let me put one word uh, on, on the table. Transparency is not, is not an end in itself, and it is not sufficient for good journalism. We're, we're all using the word here. I can be a transparent Nazi. Right? I can tell you that that's where the point I'm coming from. It does not replace good behavior and good journalistic practices. It does not replace investigating and factually verifying what you're writing. Transparency says, here's what I'm doing. You can trust that I'm doing those good practices, but it doesn't replace those practices. Lee, I, I just need to argue for one sec. I can't sit this long without arguing. Um, I think you have situations in which journalists don't hold themselves to the accountability, um, standards of accountability. However, journalism is one of the most cannibalistic professions, if not the most, uh, in the world. And so we hold each other to that. So I would ask you to find another profession that puts on the front page day after day some other journalist failing, which we do very, uh, I think, very well and pretty often. So I'll just bring that one up. Sure. Question out here comment? I come to this um, from a I'm a graduate student in the journalism school here, but I um, will be teaching public relations. And so there's been a lot of talk about transparency of donors, but I'm wondering if you could address transparency of sources, because it's kind of my view that new media allows more individuals to function in a public relations capacity, and I'm wondering how that's changing your relationship with sources. Boy, everybody's lining up. I was going to say, Martin, you want to try that? Because you're that's the soup you swim in daily. Well, I, th I think that you're, um, what you want to do is, is identify where it's coming from. I mean, is that, I, I, I'm not sure I follow your question. If you, I'm wondering, is it harder to identify, perhaps, who's acting in a public relations capacity and how that enters into the work that journalists do? Um, boy, I, 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 I think maybe it, it's harder and maybe it's growing, so I mean, you've got to work harder at it um, and keep asking the questions that, that I um, brought up before and, and why is somebody bringing you this information? Because um, re re reporters, and it, goes on now, it's always gone on, can get duped by a source saying, here's the information, boy, I'm on to a great story. Well, what other questions have they asked? And especially if that person's coming to you um, requesting anonymity, I mean, we're talking here about transparency, Where, what's behind this? And it goes back to my point about asking questions and keep on working uh, your sources um, to be able to get behind it and find out what's going on. Um, just tremendously important, and, and I agree with what, what Brant's saying. I think that the, uh, about credibility, and um, I've noticed in my career uh, mistakes that were made 30 years ago in newspapers that would just get sort of brushed, ah, well, mess that one up. Now, I think that there's such competition in many ways, your credibility is on the line. You know, you could write five or six incredibly great investigative stories, and you make one major screw up on an investigative story, and um, it just it damages could damage what you do for years. Okay, thanks. Um, we're almost out of time, and Stephen promised me I could have just a couple of minutes. I, I do want to say a couple of things. Um, I'm really privileged that I teach a media ethics class, and not only is my class very international, but it's cross disciplinary. In other words, I have. Don't anybody get offended. I have strategic communication students in my ethics class. I refer to them as my strat commies, um, which, is a, which is, a, is a label that some of them really like and some of them don't. But I want to say two things about this. I haven't heard a single issue raised here so far this morning that people in the strategic communication part of my business do not deal with, do not deal with regularly, and I think by and large do not deal with well. So I don't think that there's as much need to go out and reinvent some of this wheel as we pure journalists, news junkies, think there is. There's another profession that deals with this more in the nonprofit sector, and that's um, the University of Wisconsin has the La Follette Center. 
uh, there are, you know, many centers that deal with public policy issues and do wonk research for want of a better topic. One of the things that those policy centers all have, even if it's not written down anywhere, is in their, um, their, their DNA almost, is how do we sort out the requests that we get from people who have very clear political interests? So for example, if I teach at the Truman School, which I do, and there is a senator who calls up and wants me to do research, um, about uh, the uh, about where abortion is offered in the state of Missouri and under what circumstances most policy centers have policies to have for how to deal with those sorts of very single interest oriented sort of requests that's another place that we can go to get a lot of help because um, they've thought this through and by and large their thinking I think has been has been pretty reasonable so that's something that I want to emphasize you know, that that journalism ethics is somehow different from stratcommy ethics. I think that's one of the things that this whole area is kind of, kind of blowing wide open. Um, the second thing I want to say is I want to go back to something that, that Stephen said, because I think it's really important. Transparency is no replacement for, for good behavior. Um, and I think that journalists tend to say, I've been transparent, therefore do not question my result. I'm sorry, I think that that gets us only halfway to where it is that we want to go. And the third thing, which is really going to make people angry here, is that while I love investigative reporting and applaud investigative reporting, in some sense, the focus on investigative reporting about government that we've taken so far this morning really bothers me. In my daily personal life as a human being, I need at least as much information about the corporate and the financial system, the non-governmental aspects of our society and our culture than I do about what's going on in government. And that's not to denigrate the notion that one ought investigate government. And, but I think that phrase, one ought investigate government, isn't because government is the problem, it's because great concentrations of power are the problem. And as I live my daily life as an American in this culture, great con concentrations of power are in economic hands every bit as much as they are in governmental hands. And I think that getting corporate funding to investigate corporate is going to be a really interesting challenge. So I would like to thank all of you, and I would like for you all to thank the panel, and I think we can go eat lunch.